The time now for back pages tonight here on Sky Sports News, bringing you a first look at the sports stories in the morning's newspapers. Joining us are the Mail's Craig Hope and Martin Hardy from The Times. So welcome to you both. Let's quickly run through the headlines uh, as they reach us all the time after a bumper night of football, but it's uh, away from the pitch. United Xavi talks is the headline in the Mail. Barca legend in frame, if Ten Hag is sacked. The spitting shame of banned forest owner and I spy the knockout. So that's John McGinn pitching after scoring for Villa as they stay 100%. All eyes on Villa is the headline back page of the eye. Same picture with the uh, Villa skipper with his uh, fingers around his uh, eyes. And Stokes plays down Pakistani pitch plot. That's a story from cricket, of course. Guardian, Arsenal joy tempered by Califiori blow. Disgusting contempt is the headline there. Uh, regarding uh, Maranakis, the Forest owner. England turned to spin trio for series decider with Pakistan. Spitty ground, play on City ground. Again, the Maranakis story is covered there in the sun. Top McGinn's and Art Knox. Uh, that is uh, a Ga- Gabriel <laughs> Martinelli there for Arsenal. But the Calafiori story as well. So wins for Aston Villa and Arsenal in the Champions League. But, Craig, have to come, with you, uh, come to you with your paper story, exclusive by your colleague Chris Wheeler. United Xavi talks Barca legend in frame if Ten Hag is sacked. Craig, what do you understand from this is happening between Manchester United and Xavi? Yeah, well, just to fill you in on the details of the story, Chris, my colleague, is reporting that a United delegation have been over in Spain and Barcelona a couple of times in recent months and that... Contact has been made with Xavi Hernandez. Now, the most recent visit was last Thursday. Manchester United's response to that is that a number of high-profile meetings have been taking place over there anyway, because that's where Sir Jim Radcliffe is. But nonetheless, the story certainly hasn't been denied. And I do think that Manchester United, given how things have played out on the pitch this season, it definitely looks as if they're getting the, the ducks in a row, so to speak. I mean, for me, it looked like they were, they were getting the ducks in the row in the summer when Ruud van Nistelrooy came in as uh, as the assistant manager there. And I think we fully expect at some point Ruud van Nistelrooy to be caretaker boss. But would Xavi Hernandez, beyond that, be their pick? Well, he did a decent enough job at Barcelona during testing times as well. Remember, you know, it wasn't... A, an easy period for the club. He won the won the title two seasons ago. He's on the record saying he doesn't want to manage in Spain again. So he's obviously got that ambition to come to the Premier League. Is he the man for United? Well, only time will tell in that regard. But I certainly think if you look at Ten Hag and all of the noises around it, and I know on the record Manchester United are saying that he remains their man, but you've just got to look at the situation then. Look what's played out on the pitch this season to, to believe that surely he will not sail the season. Yeah, Craig, you mentioned flying out to Barcelona, the United delegation. I know Chris Wheeler in his piece here clarifies that to an extent and says that that was partly because of Jim Ratcliffe's been based there for the mm. Team uh, America's Cup with Ineos Britannia, the sailing event. From what you've read from this, how close do you think Xavi would be to being the Manchester United manager? Or perhaps has it gone away again after the, the win at the weekend? Well, no, it always depends on future results, doesn't it? Look, Manchester United hadn't won in five before Saturday. I think if they they hadn't beaten Brentford, then, you know, the calls for him to go, you, you can't go six without a, a victory as Manchester United manager. You look at the fixtures they've got coming up, and arguably, beyond the, the Chelsea game, they've got a favourable run there. But this Manchester United team and this Manchester United manager, what equals favourable? You know, if anything, the games against the lesser sides are more tricky because you would have no confidence in them getting the results that perhaps should do. So, no, it'll come around again, Teddy. It'll become a, a, a much more pressing matter when results don't go the way they should, which I believe, you know, is probably just around the corner. And to go back to that phrase I used... It just feels as if they're getting their ducks in the row for what I believe is the inevitable and will be a change of manager. Martin, what's your take on it? Any sympathy for, for Eric Ten Hag that this is playing out in public seemingly once again after to what happened in the summer? We saw a very discreet recruitment process by England, didn't we, in contrast? What do you think about the Manchester United manager and, and how we must feel about all this and how he's been treated? I would have more sympathy if he hadn't spent £600 million on players in his <laughs> 10 year at Old Trafford. And if by now, which we should, if we if there was a definitive style of play, if we could see the progress, the development, if there was consistency of results, if it wasn't so up and down, if they didn't lose so many games, 
Um, yeah, there'll be greater sympathy there then, but he doesn't command, he doesn't look like the Manchester United manager. And uh, as Craig said there, the Man United seemed to be doing this in the summer and backed off uh, basically on the result of a, an FA Cup final win against a very tired Manchester City. And perhaps because of that, they lose out on a manager to England. And if you are running a successful business, you do want to know who's coming next. Um, I think myself and Craig would be very surprised if Eric Ten Hag's there at the end of the season. So you have to have some people potentially lined up and Xavi is available. Um, he has a record of doing well in Barcelona in a difficult period. As to whether this is a, a, a too big a jump, I would say perhaps, having managed in Qatar and only done a couple of years in Barcelona, he may not have the the depth of experience um, that Manchester United, this huge club, de desires and needs. Uh, and we'll see where they do look, whether Ruud van Nistelrooy ends up in a short-term position there. But I'm sure we're going to talk about Aston Villa uh, in, in the rest of the programme. And there's a manager there, Unai Emery, who's won four European competitions, just seems to have absolutely completely altered the the the, the players inside Villa Park, the mood at the club. The, you know, he's a manager that's won the Europa League. This is him in the Champions League. Nobody two, two and a half years ago said Aston Villa would be anywhere near this level, and he's done it very unassuming, makes all the best, all the players they've got better. I would say if I was in charge of Man United, why aren't we looking at Villa Park and knocking on their door for the manager should Eric Ten Hag leave? Yeah, would he be attracted to that or not? Which is the most attractive job at the moment? It's a, a bit of a debate, that one, isn't it? Let's go to the Guardian and talk about Unai Emery's former team, Arsenal, before we get to Villa's great night. Arsenal joy tempered by Calafiori blow. Arsenal won Shakhtar Donetsk nil. Gabriel Martinelli and Gabriel Magales celebrate Dimitro Riznek's own goal last night. Uh, what was more concerning, Craig, do you think? Is it the injuries or is it Arsenal's form and fluidity at the moment from what you've seen? Well, the injuries, of course, but I think you, you look beyond that and it seemed like Arsenal should have a squad deep enough to deal with that. I think the bigger concern would be the performance in this game against Shakhtar tonight. Uh, wasn't I, I only watched the, the closing stages, but by all accounts before that, it wasn't very convincing. They've need, that needed David Rea to make two big saves in the in the final moments then. It felt as if they were, they were hanging on to a degree. Now, I think ultimately the important thing for Arsenal tonight was on the back of the result at the weekend. And, you know, we talk about this crisis carousel of clubs. And listen, Arsenal are many, many months and many, many matches from rejoining that carousel. But nonetheless, after a bad result at the weekend and the red card and all the fallout of that night, you don't want to have another defeat going into what is a, an absolutely huge game at the weekend against Liverpool. So to that end... They've got the result they needed, but at the same time, it's been another sticky performance that wasn't necessarily convincing. As I said there, they've needed a goalkeeper to make a couple of big saves to preserve that 1-0 scoreline. And also they've lost an important player as well. So a little bit of a bruise at night, even if they have avoided the result they didn't want. Absolutely, yep. Arsenal seven points uh, from nine. But what about Aston Villa? 100%. And the eye has all eyes on Villa as the back page there. McGinn and Kogo, top of the table of beating uh, Bologna. You mentioned it there, Martin. How impressive is this, what Villa are doing at the moment? <laughs> well, they haven't even conceded a goal yet and um, everybody was ready to see whether they could make this leap up. They've done it seamlessly. They started so well, held their nerve against Bayern. And, uh, you know, tonight there was only ever one winner. Um, the squad now has depth. The the, the interesting part of the, what happens now for Aston Villa may be the, the relationship between Ollie Watkins and Unai Emery because John Duran's knocking on that door fairly forcibly. And he got the starting role tonight and scores and does well again. So Unai Emery's going to have to choose, you know, moving forward about, how many opportunities does he give Duran and how much does that annoy Ollie Watkins, who has had the, the, the shirt himself for the time being. But the, 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 they're so impressive in what they do. They, today, they were the favourites to win the game, so they started on the front foot and took the game to Bologna against Bayern Munich. They were happy to sit back and soak it up and they can play in many different styles. Um, the, the team seems pretty unruffable. And with uh, Emery at the helm, you know, as I've just said, there are three Europa League wins with Sevilla and one with Villarreal. You've got a manager that's decorated knows what he's doing. It's just that the, will that squad be big enough with the amount of games that's going to come their way? We will see. So so far, they're doing it great. The, there's real raw motion inside Villa Park at kickoff on these nights because they've waited so long. And that's what brings the magic of the Champions League alive. 
you just look, I know Craig was fairly unhappy about this the last time we were on, but you look at the size of the Champions League league table now and it's ridiculous. It takes about three different television pages <laughs> to get it all on. They're at the top. They're probably already in the, 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 the second phase of like the Europa League. league they've already done that. Now can they hold the nerve and, and get into that top eight place and guarantee themselves a Champions League place? But it's just so refreshing to see another team inside the Champions League doing so well. And that kind of that that newness and the the, the energy that the, the crowd brings is, is is really good for the competition. Yeah, absolutely. Top of the Champions League uh, group stage, fourth in the Premier League, host Bournemouth at the weekend. Uh, Villa flying. Let's talk Nottingham Forest, though, and again, matters uh, off the pitch. The headline, spitty ground, the play on City ground. Maranakis claims hacking Sigarkov to blame for gobbing at referee's feet. Just don't call a snots, Forest. the uh, speech quote there, which isn't a quote attributed to Maranakis. Prem owners five-game banned by Dan King. Evangelos uh, Maranakis given a five-match stadium ban for spitting as a referee walked past him. The Nottingham Forest owner appealed the suspension, claimed he was coughing due to his three cigars a day habit. What do you make of this, Craig? Now, we've seen the, the quotes and the, the evidence. Hmm. I mean, listen, the Sun back page, it's a little bit of fun there. We all smiled when we saw it just before. And then you, you read Maranakis's defence. And even that is laughable. But this is incredibly serious. You know, you, you brought up playing football and being around football. And it was always said to me that, that spitting in the direction of anyone, an opponent, you know, it was the, was the worst thing you could possibly do. And for the, for the independent panel to return that, that that is exactly what he did. Five matches might seem harsh and like a, a headline grabbing number but you could argue it's it's not enough really to spit at the feet in an, an aggressive aggravated manner as he's done as a sure contempt towards a, a decision on a, on a on a on a football field really is you know that's we don't want to be going there and you know I feel pretty strongly about this and the irony the reason I feel strongly about respect towards officials is because I helped write Mark Clattenburg's book three or four <laughs> years ago and you know I came out of that with a a wholly different view on refereeing and this idea that without these guys, we don't have a game and they're not an inanimate object. You know, we've we've got to treat them with more respect and as humans. Now, I say the irony is because Mark then went in at Nottingham Forest and we all know what happened there last season, don't we? But yeah, I just think this is a really, really unsavoury episode and I'm glad they've come down with five matches. I'm glad it's made the headlines it did because there's absolutely no place for it. It's disgusting, really. Absolutely. It's a very off-putting position, isn't it, being a referee at times and the FA certainly standing up for them there. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at more of the back pages, including this set in the Metro. The Palace boss may have four games to save his job. You're watching Back Pages tonight. Welcome back and welcome back to Craig Hope from the Mail and Martin Hardy from the Times. So let's go to Martin's uh, paper. Craig, come to you about the uh, Premier League uh, Chief Executive Richard Masters here and City in feisty clash, writes Martin Ziegler, Chief Sports Reporter, and Matt Lawton, Chief Sports Correspondent for the Times. Uh, Premier League Chief Executive Richard Masters came under fire from Manchester City in a quote-unquote feisty crisis meeting with clubs and was then confronted by an elaborate fans' protest outside his central London office. Craig, what have you heard about the meeting of the Premier League clubs? Yeah, well, I've read the reports and that mean a great deal of... Uh, you know, a great deal of detail to come out of it, yeah, other than that word which you used, Teddy... Feisty. So I think this one has got a, a little way to run. But just to, to revisit the subject of it, and I think there was a, a certain degree of misinterpretation a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, myself and Martin are, are very close to this story because ATP and the, the rules associated with it, there was this idea that once Manchester City had proven certain elements of it to be unlawful, that would then, you know, trigger a, a wave of mega million vastly inflated sponsorship deals at Newcastle. That's not the case. You know, these rules are here to stay. All they're doing is amending the mechanics of them and how you get them through. So I don't think it's as big a deal as perhaps we first thought, but nonetheless, it keeps running this thread of angst between a handful of Premier League clubs and the Premier League itself. And of course, there was a uh, a truck wasn't there an advertisement outside the, the meeting there today with uh, a play on word, Richard's Masters. Uh, and yeah, it was a, a little bit of a dig at the, the, the Premier League chief executive. So this one has got plenty to run. And the next time I'm on here, I'm sure we'll still be talking about it then as well. 
What's your take on it at the moment, uh, Martin, with the, the situation? Are you hopeful of uh, a unified Premier League in the, in the near future or concerned that the, the divisions might stop the impetus of what's been such a successful competition? I, I don't think you're going to see unity for quite some time. The Premier League's legal situation with Manchester City determines that. Um, it's interesting, though, that Manchester City's legal director, sorry, Simon Cliff was at the, at the at the meeting today, and there is that element of kind of who won that battle, and he was there today, according to Martin Ziegler and, and Matt Lawton, and he was claim, claiming that the ruling, the tribunal's ruling, means that all the APT rules were immediately void and unlawful. Um, Richard Moss has disputed that claim and then told the member clubs that it would push ahead with the draft proposal to amend it, amend its rules. So you've got this, I think Man City are basically try, trying to claim the complete victory for that, which they can then take into the 115 charges against them uh, to prove that the Premier League have, have, have acted uh, outside the rules for APT. So don't expect unity anytime soon. Manchester City are going to have this battle with the Premier League. I, I think when Man City won the Premier League last season, nobody was there from the Premier League in terms of the top brass. So the, 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 there's clear division there. Um, as to what the other clubs do, we will have to wait and see. This could, as Craig says, benefit Newcastle at some point, a, a club with considerable wealth behind them, which they have not been able to really spend to the levels that they certainly originally thought. But we'll see, see how it plays out. But the fact that you're in the middle of stormy meetings tells you what's coming in the next few months. Indeed. Let's talk about uh, stormy comments and, and Pep Guardiola not happy, seemingly, with the relationship with the England national team. Pep strife at Lions injury in the Mirror Sport back page. Pep Guardiola does not know when Kyle Walker will return from injury. And Martin also talking about injuries back last season for Kyle Walker and John Stones. Has Guardiola got a point angry at miscommunication? I mean, players can't be rested just because it's a crucial time of the season for City, even if it's, even if it's friendlies, I think, which seems to particularly have irked Pep. We've we've said it before. The players are playing too many games um, to go off on to national duty and fly all over the place. Puts more pressure on them. They probably are playing with knocks in the Premier League. They have to win. They have to play for the manager's well-being and for their future and their jobs. Um, it was interesting tonight to see Mikel Arteta say that Martinelli was better for having been injured when he was on in international duty and being rested. That gives him a freshness tonight. Uh, I do understand. I think at the minute we're asking far too much of the players. Domestic competitions, League Cup, FA Cup, Premier League, Champions League. There's a competition now coming in the summer. There's international football and that's just too much. I think at some point the managers will probably go back to the Alex Ferguson days of trying their best to, to not have their players on international duty so they can rest them during that period. Obviously, that becomes then typically with the, the, the football authorities that uh, govern at, at that level. But they're playing too many games at some point, somebody's going to have to cut that schedule down. Uh, at the minute, though, it's difficult to see who's going to do that. But, Craig, for many players as well, the highest honour in the game, one of the biggest aspirations as kids is to play for their, their countries. What's your read on this situation? Does it come down to communication? Guardiola saying that there's no phone calls now between the, the countries and the clubs. Just to touch on the point you made there, Teddy, about you know that being the biggest honour. I was away with England recently covering the... The Greece game, and then I was out in Finland as well. And you know, the you can tell that players aren't going at 100%, they're not going at full, full throttle. Sorry, they are keeping something back, and that is because I think the, the priority does lie at club level. And they're invariably probably going away with that message in that year from the domestic manager. Sir Alex Ferguson always used to do it, and I was at that. That came out in Finland, and funny enough, Kyle Walker was was one of those players, and he didn't have a he didn't have a good night that night at all. And actually, we came away from it saying, "Is this just the the end of Kyle Walker?" You never see him done for pace, and the the Finnish left winger went by him at one point. Now it since transpires that he he probably did have a have an issue there. It looks like it's a knee problem, and he now is out for an unspecified amount of time. So. You know, this was always there, club versus country, but because of the increase in the number of games, that argument is only going to intensify. And as Martin said, the number of pullouts is only going to increase as well. Yep, difficult debate as well. We'll see how it unravels between the clubs and the countries. So talking on the club front, let's talk about Crystal Palace. Very difficult start to the season. Worst start since the 92-93 inaugural Premier League season. Belief the key for grounded Eagles. Glasner search for goals, but Palace boss may have four games to save his job. This in the inside pages of the Metro. Martin, he can't have been a great manager last season and a bad one this. What do you think? How secure or not is Glasner? 
the, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but they weren't very good against Nottingham Forest last night. They're not creating a great deal. Um, all that momentum that he built up last season, it, it disappears very quickly in the Premier League. Um, I look at clubs like Wolves and Crystal Palace and we talk so much about recruitment and this desire to find players, polish them up and sell them on. And at some point, it really starts to bite back at teams. Um, they lose the centre-half in the summer. They nearly lo lo lose Mark Gay to Newcastle as well. Um, they lose Michael Lise. And the team struggles for that. They, they are two very, very Anderson, Joaquin jo Anderson is, and Elisa are just two vital players to take out of that team and keep hoping that somebody else is going to take their place and they're going to kick on again. Um, this is Crystal Palace's worst start, I think, in, in, in the top level since something like 1992. Um, he will have four games to turn this round, but uh, on the show of last night, I think Crystal Palace are in for, for a, a long and difficult season. And come January, what do they decide to do if they're still fighting relegation? Do they then decide to start selling players cheaper to, to while they still, still have value? We'll have to wait and see. Um, but it's a real test for Glasner so early in his career. Yes, there are there are small details, but that goes against all the teams at the bottom. His goalkeeper should have saved the shot last night. Mm. Um, they, they hit the outside of the post in the first half. But it's the overall picture and that the, there has been criticism of him being too stubborn in his formation. So perhaps he has to change that to, to secure Palace this season.